Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the God that we can come together and start with the citizens of the county, God. We pray for these commissioners. They make decisions, God, and they not ever make them lie. And we always look to you for guidance. We pray for our firemen and our police as they're protecting the service. Pray for our military, God, as they're keeping us safe. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do. We thank you for this great state and this great community we live in. We ask that you just bless the Bless this time. God, may we honor you in each decision we make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
I, along with many other residents of this county, have concerns about the lack of laws regarding the safety and welfare of dogs in the community. Um, there are way too many examples of dogs that are <clears throat> suffering because of not having adequate food, water, and shelter, and our main concern is that they are being tethered outside 24 hours a day, and in extreme weather conditions, cold, rain. Um, we've contacted animal control on several occasions and about when, when dog, two dogs actually specifically, and the rotten dog house, the water has like uh, stuff growing in it, and it's on a heavy towing chain, just, just a few feet, about six feet. And what animal control deems appropriate is not what I feel that a reasonable person would deem appropriate. And currently, Catoosa County does not have any laws concerning tethering dogs. That's tying a dog to a post, their doghouse, concrete block, and just leave them out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, other counties in Georgia, there's over 20 counties in Georgia who have restrictions regarding tethering. Um, to, I do have a list of them if you do want them, but to name a few, Gwinnett, Cobb, Fulton, Cherokee, those counties have a restriction that owner must be outside when the dog's being tethered. Um, so I wanted to tell you a couple of, uh, a couple of reasons why it's bad, not good to tether a dog. And tethering is harmful and neglectful to dogs. Continuous tethering not only subjects dogs to harsh weather elements to which they have no escape or comfort, but the chains and ropes can cause injuries to the neck due to constant pulling, trying to get loose. There's been cases of chains actually embedded in dogs' necks. And um, there have been deaths due to dogs getting their chain or rope hung that can lead to asphyxiation. Um, many dogs have been attacked by other dogs while tethered and they don't have anywhere to run. I actually had a family member who left their dog tethered and another dog came and killed it. And um, dogs are social packed animals and need interaction with people to live a happy, safe, fulfilled lives. Unlike humans, they can't just move or find a better place to live. They're totally dependent on us for their well-being, making them very vulnerable. And it's up to us to advocate and protect them. And so we're, you're the lawmakers, and so we're hoping that you will, you know, put it on your agenda or have a discussion about it. I want to tell you a couple more things about tethering dogs. The American Veterinary Medical Association has stated never tether or chain your dog because this can contribute to aggressive behavior. They go on to say that tethering is an unacceptable method of confinement for any animal and it has no place in a humane society. Constant tethering of dogs in lieu of a primary enclosure is not a humane practice. <clears throat> tethering gives the dog a living space, sometimes as little as six feet, which disallows them to, for regular exercise that they need. Imagine having to eat, sleep, urinate, and defecate day in, day out in a six foot area. I don't think that, you know, I, we're all, I think most of us are pet lovers or it's, it's, it hurts to think about it. And <clears throat> there have been several studies actually about dog bites and tethering dogs. Um, tethering dogs become territorial and so if someone enters their space, they, they see that as a, that's the only place that I have and so they become very aggressive. Um, often a stranger will be a playful child just wanting to pet the dog, but constantly confined dogs haven't had the opportunity to socialize and may feel threatened and very likely to injure the person. According, again, to the American Veterinary Association in the study conducted in 2013, a high number of dog bites involved a tethered dog. Children are commonly victims of tethered dog attacks. In fact, <clears throat> according to the CDC, in the last five years, 48% of dog attacks caused in the state of Georgia involved children bitten by a tethered dog. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ms. Hollis. Time is up. Okay, um, and <clears throat> 
I was just going through some of the other things that I was going to, what I was going to say. Um, tethering dogs, it affects property values. Dogs bark incessantly. There's a really lot that's going to affect property values. If there is an ordinance, if you can consider an ordinance about tethering dogs, it will actually cut down on calls to the, to the animal control. Um, and I just want to give you a couple of things that, lastly, um, examples of other laws, other counties in Georgia. It's the no tethering unless there's an owner present. Tethering for three hours out of a 24-hour period. No tethering after 9 p.m. before 6 a.m. So those are some examples, but we would appreciate if you could consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Chambers. I live at 181 Sunshine Lane. Um, Well-meaning folks here. Um, I agree that there's a lot of abuse. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, chaining or tethering a dog does go bad. Uh, all owners are not good animal owners. But this county is rich in a, a hunting and houndsman history. Uh, and, uh, you know, the use of uh, stakeouts or a chain gang. I train bird dogs. Uh, one of the first things that my pups do is they get on a chain gang and it, what that does for them is it gives them the opportunity to understand that hey, I, I don't have to pull around on this thing. I can stand and be still. I don't have to bark incessantly. I, I can manage my own stress. So, because throughout that dog's life, uh, if I'm going to Kansas, to my house in Kansas, and I've got a trailer full of bird dogs, and I stop and air those dogs, Either I'm going to chain those dogs to my trailer, that trailer's manufactured with, with places to put those chains so that I can feed and water those dogs, or I'm going to find a grassy place and I'm going to extend what we call a chain gang. And it's exactly that. It's a big chain with little short chains on that chain gang so I can get those dogs out, hook them up, feed and water them, get them taken care of, load them back in the trailer, and here we go. So, you know, I just think we should be really careful about a law that we might enact that would unnecessarily uh, be detrimental to people that have been loving dog owners all their lives. I know that everybody doesn't have an, a money in a kennel like I do. Not everybody has dogs in a $300 dog house like I do, um, but I do. So at any time during the year, uh, you know, somebody can come to my home and I might have four or five dogs on a chain gang, watching me train another dog, getting excited, getting fired up, barking. We want that. We're instilling prey driving those dogs. So as, as meaningful and as understanding as I am with, this, with the other side of this, um, you know, a broad sweeping law that, that would limit my ability to train my dogs like I have done all my life would be detrimental to me. I'm not the only houseman here. I'm not the only, the only houseman in the room. But you know, you can drive down 151 uh, as an example. There's a Dalton PD officer that lives down 151. His home is visible from the road. His dog is tethered. I can see that the reason he has that dog tethered is so the dog can protect his, his door and his patrol car where he parks that. Well, that. That gentleman is not a crappy owner. He's not a piece of crap like some of these people would like to maintain that everybody that puts a dog on a chain. So, you know, we just we just can't always govern with our heart. We have to govern with our mind. We need to look at what this county has been. You can walk right down here on the, uh, the Ringgold Trail and there's a big monument and it talks about the rich history of how the people used to cross uh, the bridge and Bull Crown Taylor's Ridge and run their dogs. My grandparents did. My great-grandparents did. We grew up doing this. So I would just like for you to, to just, just think about what you're doing. Think about both sides and, and not just <coughs> govern with your heart. Govern with your mind. And think about how that would affect a lot of people that aren't in this room. 
that might not be on social media, that, that have a lot better things to do than to spend their days on Facebook. They're out working dogs, making a living. So they're not here, but, but I am here. So I'm not speaking for anybody but me, but there's a lot of people like me in this county that, that love their dogs, spend a ton of money on them, uh, that they, like their, their children. You know, my dogs live in the house with me. I still have outside dogs too. But, you know, all these people behind me know me very well. And they know how much I love my animals. <laughs> but I just can't see that the things and the practices that I do them day in and day out are harmful to my dogs. Um, they could be harmful to other dogs, but we're talking about bad owners and, and not bad practices. You can go anywhere in this county, tractor supply, Ace Hardware, any of these places, and buy a steak out in a tether. They're for sale. They're not illegal. Uh, you can go out here to uh, any of these other places and buy a five by five kennel, which is a lot smaller than the six foot area that this lady talked about. And that's how these dogs live. And they get out every day, hopefully. I can't. They, you know, they get out every day and they work hard. These are working dogs. These are not you know, pets that just sit around. They, these are dogs that, that have a purpose. And so I would just like for you just to think about those things when you're considering what these other folks are saying, that what you may enact as a law could really restrict well-meaning, dog-loving people like me. Thank you. Thank you. Betty Sunkus and I live on 107 Porter Horse Lane, about two miles from the dogs I believe we're just giving information on. I drive by there anywhere from three, maybe six times a day by the time I take nieces to school and back and my husband has doctor appointment. Anyway, I'm by there every day. Those dogs for four years, the first one, not those two, was there on that chain. There was never any kind of human contact with that dog. I would go by at times when they had company out in the front yard, they were picnicking and all that, I would sit there like he was begging for someone to, there's no kind of care for the dogs. I actually stopped there one time to look at a truck he had for sale and asked him about his dog being on the chain all the time, would you, would you like me to find him an owner if y'all don't have time for him? No, we love our dog. The dog was so nasty and I watched him go down all the time. I did, I was one once called the Humane Society. And they said, no, nope, if there's a dog, dog bowl out there and there's a house, there's nothing we can do. And that was it, there was no conversation. I come to the point of wanting to move because it broke my heart to see that, but then that's not fair to the dogs. Somebody's gotta be a voice for those dogs. Uh, the gentleman just spoke, his, his situation is entirely different. And you know, there is a difference in the way you, your way of life is. <laughs> But those dogs are so neglected, and there's one in my neighborhood right now in one of those five foot chained fences that's never recognized or seen. The man had one there a couple of years ago, and the police did come and they did, they took his thing down and they were gone, but he just brought in another one. There's no law, we need something to stand behind these people that just, I don't even understand why they buy the dog. Is it just an ornament to stand in their front yard? When I went by there yesterday, um, I noticed, I didn't even realize at the time that there was a second dog there. And these dogs, when they come in, the last one, I can't say for sure what happened to it. I've been told that he's no longer living, um, but I don't have anything to back that up. And he's gone, and this puppy was brought in, and he was so energetic, and he was running and playing and happy, and you could just sit there every day and watch that dog's demeanor go down and down and down until he's just laying there in the mud. One day he was so tangled up he couldn't even walk, he couldn't move, he had wrapped himself around the tree so many times. And I stopped and knocked on the door. I said, I just want to let you know your dog's really tangled up in his chain and he's not able to move. And one of the children says, oh, well, we'll go get it. And they went and wrapped it and that was the end of that. And the dog's still on that same chain, still at the, well, I don't know what kind of leash he's on now, and still at the same tree. There's, there's no care for those dogs. And I know that they're just one of many more. And I want to be a, a voice for those kind of dogs. 
because I can't stand to see them done in life. Miller and I live in the county and uh, as you've told me before this is not a question and answer session I beg to differ with you because as elected officials you owe the taxpayers of Catoosa County the courtesy of answering our questions during public appearances you are insistent on bringing in a transportation tax to our county which would bring number four tax one cent extra tax into our county, bringing a total of eight cents on sales tax on most everything bought in our county. Our county taxes are getting dangerously close to Chattanooga sales tax, which is nine and a quarter percent. You have already voted to put this tax on a March ballot. You are assuming it will pass. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Several years ago, this same issue was defeated. I am also offended that you threatened to increase our property taxes if we don't vote for this tax. The school board also does the same thing when they want to raise our taxes again. I, for one, will not vote for this tax, and I don't think the people of Catoosa County will stand for more tax increases. I hope they will stand up to you, say no new taxes, and vote you out of office in 2020. This issue could have been put on one of three ballots during our 2018 elections. Why didn't you do that? We do not need to waste tax money for a special <coughs> election. For those not familiar with the inner workings of elections, every precinct, and we have nine, has to be open on election day. Two precincts are open for early voting for three weeks. For this special election, probably two people will be working in each precinct. These people are paid workers. Absentee and provisional balance also have to be printed, plus the cost of utilities for each precinct. Then there are people who are paid to do final counts, cost of extra paper and ink for the machines, and many other things. If passed, this tax should not be added to everything we buy, but should be applied only to fuel, as Roger Nelson stated at our last commission meeting. However, I, for one, will be spreading the word to everyone to vote no on this tax, and I will also work diligently to get a big change on our commission board in 2020. At the swearing-in ceremony for our judges and two new commissioners, there was a statement made by our commission chairman. He said that the outgoing commissioner's shoes would be hard to fill. Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that anybody's shoes can be filled, even yours. My name is Phyllis Williams, and I live in the county and watch a race. I, I, the tax is one thing, putting it in the right place is another. And I don't know if any of y'all are on Facebook, but one of the city council people put an article on there, and if I'd have had time, I would have made every one of you a copy, because this is not about fixing roads, and remember, you all are road and revenue commissioners. Take care of money, take care of roads. That's your main purpose here. And this thing right here tells you there's certain people wanting to take some of this money for roads, forget the potholes, and make bike trails and greenways. Well, that is not what you all have set up here for over a year and preach to the public about that one cent. So y'all need to get together about what's really gonna happen to this penny. One other thing on the, on the agenda is about a house and property for the fire department. Years ago, we went through another thing about buying a house. 
okay? Did you get a house of praise? What's it going to be used for with the fire department? Was soil test done? Were water tests done? And if you did, you maybe can answer this. Where are they and how do we look at them? Because we're really interested in why we would be buying a 5,000 foot square home for a fire department. Thank you. Hey, George Battersby, Patty Road, District 4. I really appreciate the ladies coming to speak about the problem with the dogs. And I'm an animal lover very much. And uh, I think the whole problem is with the culture of the, the uh, animal control people in, in Catoosa County. Unless that changes, nothing else will. We've got a, a huge kill rate, 27% of the dogs, 50% of the cats, and 100% of everything else. So I really appreciate the ladies coming. Uh, and I'm here not because of that. I had missed the last meeting because of a, an emergency. But before you all made the decision, and I, I'm referring this to the three commissioners that have been here, not the two new ones, uh, before you came up with the decision on the T-spots, did you realize the per capita income in Catoosa County is $25,000, 12% um, poverty level. Georgia is the third number three in personal bankruptcies at 4.57 per 1,000. 300 people will go bankrupt in Catoosa County this year. And as far as gas tax, Georgia has the highest gasoline tax in, in the region at 31.09 um, cents a gallon versus Tennessee 2104, Kentucky 26, Mississippi 18, South Carolina 1675, and we're sitting at 3109 disgraceful. Uh, and Georgia has a state income tax, a very lucrative lottery, and has decided not to have the the uh, tax-free weekends for back-to-school supplies for the really needy families. Georgia has, has decided they don't need it. Uh, of course, I think we have the sorriest, shadiest state senator, Jeff Mullis, in the world who's not interested in returning calls or doing anything unless there's something in it for him, like his friend uh, from Port Oglethorpe that uh, hired him and then he got in trouble, got uh, caught embezzling $70,000 and uh, Mullis did try and help him, but he, he almost got in trouble trying to help him, interfering with justice. So it's really a, dis it's really a uh, disgrace that every, that this new t uh, sploss, which really should be called an f sploss for food tax, because that's mainly what it's going to affect. And f sploss, you can use the F for whatever pretty that <laughs> suits you. It's, it's a letter F. No, yeah, food, food, yeah, but you can use it for any reason you want to. Uh, and anyway, um, I, I really don't, haven't trusted you all with the decisions I've seen you make the last couple of years. I got interested in local politics after you all kicked my handicapped son off a bus that he was getting taken to school every day in Chattanooga. You couldn't find a few dollars to do that. You found a little legal loophole to do that. So you kicked him off. You didn't care about him. Nobody's ever asked me about how he was doing. Uh, so you've, you've proven to me where your heart is at. And you spoke at the, at the, uh, you spoke at the swearing in ceremony about unity and caring. Well, you sure haven't shown it. And I, I wouldn't trust you all whatsoever with the uh, $12 million, million dollars a year that this new tax, which hopefully won't get in, and I'll be out there with the girls uh, with pickets anywhere they want to go. Legally, of course, uh, and I, I'm not interested. I don't own a canoe, so I'm not interested in spending a million dollars to uh, to uh, have a canoe ramp and buy an old house that's uh, that where somebody is owed a favor. So I guess that's. Uh, I think if the, if it if it doesn't go through, which I don't expect it to, I think you three commissioners ought to pay the sixteen to twenty thousand dollars it's going to cost to have this election. Thank you. 
I would just like to say, I'm here about the dogs as well. There is a difference between someone that tethers a dog for training and someone that simply puts them outside in the freezing cold weather. There's a difference between a water bowl that's sitting there with frozen water and things growing in it and food that's moldy. There is a difference. What I would like to see happen, maybe it's not to do with the tethering as the humane treating of an animal. There's a major difference there. If there is a good owner like this gentleman, that's great. But there are so many that do not take care of these animals. Thank you. I'm sorry. Address. Thank you. Uh, 417 Appaloosa Drive. Sorry about that. Ma'am, do you want to My apologies. Thank you. Expenses and materials and, and that type of thing. 
so we, we ask you all again to serve as our physical agent. <laughs> Sometimes some gear might last three or five years. 
uh, others we can get sometimes, you know, uh, 12 or 13 years out of it. Uh, so it kind of balances itself out. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman and Board, uh, before you to consider is a proposed resolution to amend Section 603 of our County Personnel Policy or Employee Handbook. Presently, that's the section that sets forth the requirements of how we advertise open employment positions. Presently, there are several requirements that must, must be met, and one of those requires that every single advertisement shall contain a salary range. In a few instances, the county manager and staff have run into problems where posting a specific salary range before you know the qualifications of the candidates you're going to get has been a problem. Uh, namely that you might get a qualified candidate that if you post a really low salary range they won't even apply. So the management has requested that this section be amended and provide that every posting of an open position will either include a specific salary, a salary range, or it can provide that salary will be determined based on the candidate qualifications. And that's the requested amendment to the policy language. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions? Second. All in favor of approving, say aye. Aye. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the last 18 years, uh, Catoosa County has contracted with Tile Technology to provide the accounting uh, software. Uh, in this, they've provided an update uh, annual license uh, and maintenance and support. Uh, Catoosa County has always hosted their own serve on site, but uh, since we no longer have an in-house IT uh, person, we've had to contract that with another vendor. Uh, look, we looked at the quote from Tyler uh, to provide the uh, total service, uh, the updated license, maintenance, and support, as well as uh, hosting the server, which provided for uh, off-site backup. Uh, also uh, uh, took us out of the server business, basically uh, no longer maintaining uh, the server. Uh, and there were several benefits uh, to the option, including compatible cost. The cost was almost equal to uh, providing it in in house, uh, offsite backup, as we all know, is more secure. Uh, we got more responsive support because it's in house time. Uh, no more server replacements and uh, faster upgrades to our software. Our staff recommends that. Uh, we approve a three-year contract. The proposal is uh, $34,349 annual with an upfront cost of $6,500 to migrate uh, the system and also uh, set, set it up on that uh, server. Total contract amount be $109,547 for the three-year contract. I have a motion to approve. I'll make a motion. Uh, second. Second. Yeah, I think it's a question. Any questions for Paul? Now, this is the same. We've used these for 18 years. We're just letting them handle our hosting now. Yes, sir. And, and uh, <coughs> it's provided for in our uh, current budget. Oh, yeah. We'll be 
we should have paid on paper over the plane's got to build up for the need of the team to operate. Yes, it's much more, much more secure offsite. And uh, and here again, uh, uh, they will maintain the backups. And if we have, in case of a disaster, they uh, will provide us uh, support for recovery. All in favor of approving, say aye. All right. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we've completed the fiscal year 2018, and uh, we have a proposed uh, budget amendment. It's a full budget amendment for that fiscal year. Uh, each year, at the end of the year, uh, we have to do a cleanup of the uh, of the ledger. And for external financial reporting purposes, our governmental funds, which our major fund is the general fund, our budgeted revenue by source must be equal to or less than actual revenue. And budgeted expenditures by department must be equal to or greater than actual ex expenditures. Therefore, no negative variances uh, in either one of those. And, uh, uh, finishing up the uh, the county general fund received more revenue uh, than previously anticipated and although having been required to meet changing governmental expenses and, and needs during the year uh, the current fiscal year the county was able to accomplish these needs with less than anticipated expenditures having said that the uh, uh, revenue exceeded uh, the budgeted revenue by one million six hundred fifty-three thousand. Actual expenditures were less than the budgeted expenditures by one million one hundred forty-seven thousand. Therefore, favorable to budget two point eight million dollars. Uh, ex revenue exceeded expenditures. And here again, that uh, went into the general fund uh, reserve balance. Uh, for the total of all funds, the proposed budget amendment was an increase of 156757 Total of all funds, revenue and expenditures went from 45,768,693 to 45,925,450. You have a motion to approve this budget amendment. I make that motion. Second. Any questions? Yes. Favorable. <laughs> Revenue exceeded expenditure. And we were how much under budget to spending? One point one million. One point one million. All, right. All in favor of approving the amendment say aye. All right. Oh, you got a financial report? Uh, yes, I'd like to report on the second month ending November of 2018, second month of the uh, fiscal year 2019. Uh, revenue before other operating uh, sources and operating transfers for the two months was four million five hundred and eighty seven thousand. It was sixteen point ninety seven percent of budget. Therefore exceeded the budgeted revenue by eighty two thousand five hundred and thirty one thousand five hundred and thirty one dollars a one point eight percent. It was favorable to prior year, 211,679, or 4.8%. Expenditures before other operating, uh, other financing uses and operating transfers out were 4,195,000, or 16.1% of budget. Therefore, less than budgeted expenditures by 153,755 or 3.5 percent. 
expenditures were unfavorable to prior year, 354,000 or 9%. In summary, after other financing sources and operating transfers out, revenue for the two month period exceeded expenditures, 260,000. Favorable to budget, 260,000. Although unfavorable to prior year, 204. Also, in, in conjunction with that report, we, we have the revenue report for the three months uh, ended December. And this is the third month of the current fiscal year. Uh, and the local option sales tax receipts for the first three months of fiscal year 2019, they exceeded budget 149000 or 8.5% and exceeded the same period last year, 149,000, or 8.5%. <coughs> Cumulative loss receipts for the most recent 12 months uh, ended in December were favorable or exceeded prior year 422,000, or 6%. The current month exceeded the same period prior year 53,000 or 9%. On the SPLOS receipts for the 53 month period of the 2014 SPLOS, which is a 60 month period of, uh, cycle, which ends in July, was 43,858,347. We're currently at 82.8% of budget. Plus receipts for the most recent 12 months exceeded the prior 12 months by 602,000, or again, 6% improvement over the prior 12 months. The current month exceeded the same period last prior year, 75,741, or 8.6%. That concludes the revenue report. <coughs>
to purchase an 11 acre tract of land and the home and improvements located on the land at 178 East Nickajack Road. That property adjoins current property owned by the county and used as a part-time fire station and for recreational purposes. The purchase price in the contract is $480,000 for the closing date on or before February the 28th of 2019. The sale, or in other words, if this is approved, the county's obligation to be purchased is contingent on an appraisal of the property showing that the value is equal to or exceeds the purchase price. So if an appraisal will be ordered if this contract's approved, we didn't want to incur the expense unless it is approved, but if for some reason the appraisal is less than the purchase price, the county's under no obligation to purchase the property. I'll be happy to answer any questions the board may have, but I believe that <clears throat> Ms. Vaughn and potentially Chief Camp have some more detailed information about the cost savings I think that can come from this. I think entertain a motion before we start. Yes, I think you would entertain a motion to approve and to get a second, and then you can engage in discussion and questions. You have a motion to approve. So moved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, we looked at uh, there at the station two uh, that we currently have, and there's not really adequate facilities to house people 24 hours a day. Uh, there's no shower facilities and uh, warm bathroom, so we don't have separate male female uh, bathrooms and sleeping quarters. I don't need any rest, but there's no room to put a field line out. Uh, no, sir. There's a, you know, it's landlocked. We, we, <coughs> what you see in the borderline, the property lines are right on the building. <coughs> and so there's no field lines at that location. Uh, there's just a tank. So anytime that we really start uh, using the water, uh, the toilets and stuff like that, you know, it starts to back up. So that's a problem. Another problem is that there's no way to tear it down and start over because you just don't have the space. Uh, so we looked, we looked at going across the street, and we thought that would be a better alternative as to build across the street. Uh, we do have the test, soil samples, and things that were taken, and uh, none of the property perked. You know, even, even though uh, there are field lines out there, it doesn't meet today's standards. And so we were, we were you know, told that won't work. Uh, the other dilemma that we're into is that we cannot move the fire <coughs> no more than four tenths of a mile in any direction. And if we do that, we'll throw some of our citizens over the five road miles. And some of you that are familiar with the ISO, Catoosa County has four ratings. I know it gets a little complicated, but we, we do have a three and three X, which we're very proud of, but you have to be within a thousand foot of a fire hydrant and within five road miles of the fire station. So the citizens that are over the five road miles would go to a class 10 now. And so that 10 means no fire protection, which your insurance rates would be extremely high. And I welcome any citizen to call your, your insurance agent and ask them, you know, if I had a class three fire department, which I have, if we went to a 10, what would my ratings be? So we're, we're really the strategic location of the Nickajack Road Fire Station is imperative to stay within that vicinity. I know that you look at the drawing and you think that's really expensive, but let's just look at what we've done in the past here in Catoosa County. Uh, the last station that we renovated was $726,000. I think it was budgeted at 722, and we came under budget at 718. Uh, in the fire stations, we do everything that you do in your house. Uh, we live there, we cook there, we eat there, we use the restroom, we take a shower, and we do sleep at night. So I've always said in my 42 years as a firefighter, and, and jokingly I've always said that my fire station is a house with a garage attached to it. I have, I have a fire truck in my front, front room. So the concept of some uh, some departments across the country, I'm not going to say all, but you do have some. We have two 
in our region that have, have, have purchased a house and built a two-bay station next to it. They do this for several reasons. The cost of building a house versus the one that's already built uh, versus a metal type building. Uh, metal buildings and things we typically know uh, cost a lot more to build. So uh, it, is, it was estimated the plans we were looking at was to just duplicate uh, the Graysville Road fire station, which that fire station would have been uh, 1.3 million estimated new. And there's also uh, no property at this time that we have. Uh, this property came available. It is a, a house. And so the 11 acres would uh, have, be able to have. The house is uh, somewhere around the 480 figure. Uh, and so we estimate that the base would be 400,000. It might be less. And this is just a possibility of what it could look like. That doesn't mean it will look like that. It depends on the cost that you want to spend. But somewhere the bags are around four, the house is 480. So we're looking at 880,000. Uh, 880,000 for a fire station uh, to me is a good deal, especially compared to what we were proposing, uh, the 1.3. So, you know, anytime we can save money and, and still do what we need to do, provide that fire station, a place for our, citizens, our firefighters to live, a station that's uh, good in the community as far as district and response times, and we do, uh, since y'all have approved to staff that station in Nickajack, it becomes a little more imperative to get the property there because we have put out notice to hire the firefighters and hopefully have them in the door and get them started by April and then uh, have them in that area, you know, in June and July. Our current response times in the Nick and Jack Road is we only have four volunteers there. Uh, during the daytime, most of them are at work. So our response times into the, into the Wood Station community is around 15 minutes on average response time. Some less, some more. Uh, we do have a school there, we do have a lot of traffic. Uh, so it becomes more imperative to have a station in that location, especially one of the staff, uh, to cut down these long response times and offer our citizens can provide a more uh, quick response uh, response on medical calls and fire that they deserve. So uh, that's why the proposal or the thought process was was to look at this house and also from the fire department standpoint uh, we have no place to train. So we do have places, we have some burn buildings behind Station 6 on Three Notch Road. We have a training tower behind Station 1, uh, which is very limited. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes to lay out hose and do the exercises that we need to do. This property would afford us the luxury of having some property to consolidate our training facility into one place. Uh, we don't really have an area that we can go drive on a driving course. Uh, we do currently use uh, the ball fields parking lots or gravel. Uh, we can't be there all the time because they do practice. Uh, so it limits our access to having some place to, to do, to be able to drive and do the things that we need to do. So we, we look for the future of having the maybe moving the training facility in that location. Uh, it's a possibility. There's a lot of possibilities for the property. Uh, the property also adjoins uh, the current property that the county currently owns. So there's always expansion on the recreation side and things like that. So uh, for that, that's why we came up with the proposal uh, to purchase the property and purchase the house, build a two-bay garage to the side of it. And this one here shows it in front uh, to, to kind of hide it a little bit and fit into the community. That's one thing that uh, over the years that I've heard people say is we have a residential area and then well, here's this big metal building. So I think that it would, this type of drawing would fit into the community there better into the other houses that are on Nick Jack. Uh, but that's all the comments I had. If you have, uh, have any questions? Well, if you look at some of the prices before I became fire chief, that was my understanding. She had bids to 
3 PlayStation 3 is bulldozed it down to the lower. And those prices were around $1.5 to $1.8 million. I've got a question. Uh, what kind of uh, citizen is there any way, I know this is contingent on the appraisal, you were talking about the station you're at now with perk problems. Um, what about perk test, home inspection, um, any people to be able to react to the poor reason what that problem is? The test problems to make sure that we Chairman, uh, Yvonne Morgan and Rick Huggins were selected by the board to fill the two vacancies um, on the Alcoholic Beverage Board and just made a motion and a vote of the board approving that. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor of approving, say aye. Aye. Uh, I would remind the board that uh, under our rules, only uh, one person can only serve on one board.
chairman, the next board that we need to fill vacancies for is the uh, Board of Tax Assessors. Uh, under this particular board, we have um, two vacancies and we have four candidates. We had five, but we have marked Rick Huggins off because Mr. Huggins was elected to the alcohol beverage board. So you will vote for two for a four year term. <coughs> Chairman, uh, <clears throat> Mike Key and Little Folks received three votes each, so they would be in the name to the Board of Tax Assessors. In addition to the record, probably need a vote of the Board approving. Do I have a motion to approve the ballot? A motion? All in favor of approving, say aye. Aye. Next, Mr. Chairman, we have Planning Commission. Uh, we have two vacancies for a three year term. Here to select two from the uh, candidates on each ballot. And again, Mr. Huggins has been marked off because he
Jeff and Wanda Lynn, Jeff Alba and Wanda Lynn Grier have been selected to serve three year terms. Did I have a motion to accept Jeff Alba and Wanda Lynn? So Chairman, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I want to welcome uh, Charlie Stevens and Chuck Harris to the board and we look forward to working with you. Welcome to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, my name is Charlie Stevens, District Board Commissioner. Thank you for the support for getting me here. I'll do everything in my power and in my heart to do right for the family. I uh, just want to thank everybody for your support in the election. And uh, uh, thank you for coming out tonight and uh, showing the love for your county. And, and uh, that's why I'm here, because I care. And I want to make a difference. And, uh, and I appreciate you coming out and showing your support for your county. I'd just like to, uh, yeah, I'd like to say thank you for your support and your trust in me for putting me in this position and I appreciate seeing each and every one of you uh, exercising your right to come in and voice your opinion. And I look forward to working with everybody in this room. Yes. I also would like to thank everyone that, that did apply for you know, these committees and all that put it on. There was more more position or more people than we have positions, but uh, thank everybody for applying. Thank everybody for coming out. And you want to be the deputy commissioner for taking time. Am I interrupting everybody? I want to thank my two deputy commissioners. I appreciate working with them. So at this time, do I have a, actually, we're going into executive session for personnel, legal, and land acquisition. Mr. Stevens? Yes. 
Yes.